you're getting at least 4,000 new subscribers to your producer channel a month, which is, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, definitely. What's going down, everyone? Welcome back to No Pain, No Gain. Um, I kind of went rogue on today's episode and recruited a very special guest. This is a guy who I've really not ever spoken to kind of ever in life other than a couple YouTube comment replies. His name is Riley Beats, R-L-Y Beats. I know there are no uh, vowels in his name other than in the beats part, which is not the confusing part, but his name is Riley Beats. I'm going to start calling myself DJ PN and then number one, and then just kind of let people figure it out. You think that's a good strategy? I think that is. Uh, it might get a little confusing for some people, especially like if you switch up now, but it could work. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it's working for you. I'm just, I'm all about stealing other people's ideas as long as they're working for them, which is kind of what this whole interview is about. I'm, I'm just going to pick his brain and then all of us watching are going to steal his ideas and, and become uh, YouTube celebrities. So man, first of all, appreciate you doing this. Thank you for coming on, especially kind of out of nowhere. Um, it's my pleasure, honestly. It, 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 honestly, the YouTube algorithm, I, I think I probably, I don't say this out loud, but probably like in my head, I might say fuck YouTube once or twice every single day. <laughs> but the YouTube algorithm is actually doing a great job uh, when it comes to your content recently because I've been getting recommended quite a bit of it. And so that's how I started getting involved in, in um, watching your videos. So to start with, when I, I think this is, this is my very cursory research, but I think you've um, been, been on YouTube for three years, or at least the channel that you're on right now is three years old. Is that, is that accurate? It's kind of funny. Like it actually, I think I started it back in like, 2017 or something like that um and that was way before i started producing i was actually like i started off rapping and i very quickly realized i was a terrible rapper same um, so so i kind of switched over over the years so the channel is like a little bit old oh did you delete a bunch of your your rap yeah content? they're all gone they're gone they have to be gone they're hidden no <laughs> one can see that <laughs> someone's gonna find them someone someone in the comment section uh, re upload some, some of uh, Riley's old, old leaks. But, I think there's still some on SoundCloud, honestly. Yeah, they'll, they'll find you, man. You can't, <laughs> you're not safe. Uh, but that's interesting that you didn't start a new channel when you completely did a 180 in terms of the, the content of your channel. Why did, you, why did you not just start a new channel? I didn't really know. Like, I had no knowledge going into my channel at all, really. Um, cause it's gone through like a few changes over the years. It first was, was a channel for me rapping as, as terrible as it was. It turned into my tight beat channel, which had a little bit of success starting out. Um, and then slowly that kind of just turned into just producer content from there, just shifting with, with kind of what came with it and, and how the flow was going for the channel. I think that's interesting because and invaluable for the people watching because a lot of people are afraid to pull the trigger on anything new because they overthink it. It's like, I, I get the question all the time. Should I revive my, my YouTube channel? Nothing's working right now. Should I just start a new channel? Because, you know, you hear stuff and I have my theories. Um, mm -hmm. You hear that new YouTube channels kind of get a break in the algorithm, depending, you know, if their content's good, they'll get a break. And yeah, maybe, but for you, you didn't even think that hard. You just said, all right, I'm done rapping. Let me just switch it up and see what happened. You've actually switched up your channel's content three times because you were first Riley, the rapper, which I hope is what, what your MC name actually was spelled the same way. R L Y T H R P R. And then it went to the type beats channel. I want to talk about that really quickly. Cause that was, that's the oldest video I could find of yours. It was, it was beats that you were uploading three years ago. Mm -hmm. And it looks, I went, I clicked on the buy link and it, it sent me to a 404 error. So you've just deleted your beat store. You don't sell beats anymore. I still, I still sell beats. It was just a lot of those like early beats. Like that's my, my first beat, the oldest video on that channel. That's my first ever beat that I made. Um, I didn't have beat stars. I had no idea what beat stars was at the time. So I think it was like a, a Google Dropbox or like a Google drive or a Dropbox link. Um, and I, I probably deleted it just for, for storage purposes, like a few years ago or so. 
Yeah, those Dropbox links, man. Once you start uploading, you know, public content, I've tried a couple times, and I get the like for for kits and stuff, and it just doesn't work. Uh, so you you are actively licensing beats online. I am, yeah. I'm I'm not really uploading beats anymore, just because I don't have enough time in the day to really be making beats, posting them. Um, but I made a, a separate type beat channel just as kind of a little experiment, just to kind of show what I did back when I was uploading type beats because I had a little bit of success um, with that. And I did it for about two months, uh, made probably the best two months on beat stars of the entire year. Um, just cause you know, there's actually content going into that, but outside of that, like I don't really actively push my, my beats all that much. Yeah. Why'd you, why'd you stop? Um, what, what made you go from finding success selling beats to just completely pivoting and making um producer content because because very different demographics very different <laughs> strategies yeah definitely and and for me what really kind of solidified the push was i was getting way more opportunities from production content even from a standpoint of, of like placements so i know I've got a song actually coming out with uh, Stunner for Vegas, Big K BZ, and King Tut King Shad on October 6th. I guarantee you I would not have that opportunity if I didn't have my producer content. Because what happened for me was um, one of the producers who worked on the song with me, he saw my content. He reached out to me and said, hey, I really like your videos. I want to work with you. And we got working and I've got a bunch of songs with that producer that are either out now or are going to be coming out. Yeah, I th I think uh, a lot of people are now figuring out, especially loop makers, mm -hmm. that a, a great pathway to placements is is collaborations, and oh, so they're kind of kind of flooding emails. You know, I think uh, <laughs> I think there are some better strategies out there. I, well, you're laughing, so are you are you seeing some some Let's not dwell on the negative. What are some some good strategies that that you've seen producers use or that you yourself have have used to network with other producers? And then what are maybe some things to avoid rather than just you know going in on producers that are messing their lives up? Yeah, I, I know. Um, I'll start out with something to avoid because I know it's just it's still on my mind. It's just spamming people with loops is the worst way. Like you're gonna get blocked so quickly. And once you're blocked, like I'll see that again, cause I'm going to keep using the same email. Um, and it's just kind of like a red flag for me and kind of building off of that. I had this one guy that was sending me a one loop at a time every single day. And it's, it's too much at that point in time, you know, like there's people who will send me just random loops every now and then that's not that big of a deal, but one loop every single day kind of floods my email. It's a little too much. Um, but, but things that producers definitely should be doing that I'm not seeing enough of is exposure. It's the best way to get yourself out there. I know RJ Passon, he recently blew up on TikTok. Um, I, I remember I watched his TikTok videos back when he was just not really making loops on, on TikTok. And now he's got songs on, with Joe Kenji. He released his own song, did like 2 million streams on Spotify in a month, um, you know, and it's just like these little things, like all he's doing on TikTok is just playing his loop. That's it. Um, and there's a lot of producers that are doing that, but not not enough are doing it, you know? Okay. I'm, I'm taking notes. Yeah. Shit. All right. That was, that hit home. So earlier you said you didn't have time to make beats right now with your schedule. And you make a ton of content. I mean, how, how many videos shorts included how, how many let's just call it how many pieces of content would you say you upload per week that's a good question i think it depends a little on the week because i do do streams as well um and those are a little bit more infrequent so a busy week would be about like nine ten video or nine ten pieces of content um but a regular week is around like nine i would say and is that mostly youtube or are you on tiktok are you uploading reels are you spreading that content among the various platforms 
Yeah, so I've been um, posting it on TikTok as well, also on um, on Instagram Reels. Uh, I did take a break from doing it on on TikTok and Instagram Reels because again, my schedule got really busy for a period of time, <clears throat> and I just needed a little, little bit of time just to kind of recollect and come back to it. What has your experience been with with TikTok and Reels? I feel like that for me, it's been up and down. I, I'm curious to hear yeah. what this is like. Well, I find what, what's weird to me is like my content, my producer content really started out with TikTok. Um, I posted this one TikTok that I also posted to, to YouTube Shorts. It did really well on TikTok. It did really well on YouTube Shorts. And <clears throat> just kind of from there, it did way better on TikTok. So I thought, okay, I'll keep posting to TikTok and then just uploading it to YouTube Shorts is kind of the second thing. And eventually, because like you said, TikTok, it's up and down. Uh, TikTok took the back seat for, for content for me. Um, but now it's, it's kind of a bit more stabilized, I feel. And I know as well, I'm going to compare the algorithms because the TikTok algorithm is very, it's quick. You know, it's, you, you post a video, you're going to get the views fast if you're going to get views and it's not going to have that longevity. Whereas YouTube shorts, like I'm still getting tens of thousands of views on really old YouTube shorts. Like I think I got like 10 K views on um, like a video of mine that was like a year old just the other day. Well, here's something that I don't think a lot of producers realize, right? So when I upload and I'll upload the same piece of content that I put on TikTok as I do on YouTube shorts. And when I use similar hashtags, like the hashtag music producer, right? On TikTok, it, that might be millions of videos. It'll, it'll tell you the number, you, you know, when you, when you put it in, it mm -hmm. tells you how many other pieces of content fall under that hashtag. When you do the same thing on shorts, it's like 10% of that. So there are very few people posting producer content under those hashtags. I wonder if that's part of it. I want to get more into shorts with you um, shortly, no pun intended, but is this a full-time job for you now, producer content? I actually have a nine to five. I, I graduated university with a computer science degree. Um, so I'm working as a data engineer for the nine to five portion of my life. Uh, and that does pretty, pretty well. So kind of try to balance the two. Are you Canadian? I am. Yeah. Okay. I ju just one, some of the words that you pronounce, I'm like that. He sounds Canadian, but then also you said I graduated university. I'm like America, North Americans don't, well, or United States citizens don't say that. <laughs> we say we graduated from college. So that's a very uh, sophisticated um, way to say the same thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, Canada's winning. Uh, it, it seems to, from the outside looking in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like it was just yesterday that you posted that your channel hit 100,000 subscribers, and then I blink, and you're at, at what, 112,000 right now? Yeah, I think I think that's right. Did that happen really quick? Did that extra twelve thousand happen pretty quickly after? Well, the whole like getting to the hundred k happened really fast, in my opinion. Like, I know for a long while leading up to it, I was kind of talking with my community just about releasing a, a free kit for when I hit hundred k, just kind of ce celebrating it with the community. Um, and I think it was like early September is what all the analytics were, were projecting that was going to be. So I was preparing it to be early September. And then all of a sudden, early August or so, it, it happens and I'm just completely caught off guard. Um, so it happens pretty quick. But with the, the subs subscriber count, it's been very like up and down. Like sometimes it'll be like 2K subscribers in a week and then some weeks it'll be like 1K subscribers. So it's... It's like, that's probably the least predictable statistic I've found for me. But your YouTube channel is still growing. I mean, you're getting at least 4,000 new subscribers to your producer channel a month, which is, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, definitely. When, what was the turning point? When did things start taking off when you knew what, like, was there a particular video or was there a particular moment that you can remember where you just suddenly saw this growth? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a little funny story. Um, I think it was like a year and a half ago, I was going through this breakup and 
I was just like, okay, I make beats. I'm just going to post a, a YouTube short, a TikTok video. Um, and that one YouTube short kind of blew up. It did way better than I expected. It got like a couple thousand views like the first day. And <clears throat> that was kind of the moment for me that kind of hinged the whole thing. And I knew like I was going back to my parents' place for the holidays at the time. And I remember I, I Damn, it was a breakup family. around the holidays. Yeah. It, it happens, you know, it, I, oh, it I happens to all this. See, and you know, when I usually get broken up with before my birthday, but right after theirs, Oh, yeah, it's that's, that's strategic. Cause I don't get shit. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're planning that. But my yeah. bad. So you're you're at you're planning to go to your family for the holidays, or or yeah. how do you say it in Canada? You're you're going back to my parents' place. But there's a way. Um, I know at least British people don't say they're going on vacation. They say I'm I'm gone for a holiday or something. Do you say that in Canada like that? I've never heard that. Oh damn! All right, you're not as sophisticated <laughs> as, as I thought. But yeah, so I was just I was I was, oh excuse me I was going back to my my parents' place. Um, and I remember I texted my friend and I was just like, Hey, like I've got this video. It was blowing up. I'm going to be at my parents' place. All I'm going to have is a laptop, no speakers. The only thing I really had that was kind of a speaker was the TV that was in my room. Um, and I was just like, do you think I should like post a, a video with that? And my friend never really got back to me um, or at least in time. So I just kind of recorded a video from my phone of the TV screen with some sound and, kept pushing that momentum and i think i've been posting pretty much daily roughly since then what was in that particular breakup video that really you think resonated with people i think it was mostly like youtube shorts was still a very fresh kind of landscape at the time um and, and even still it's very fresh like there's not a whole ton of people on youtube shorts that are taking up a lot of the space um but it was pretty much just very similar to some of the content I still do where it's just like, here's how to make a melody, start out with some bass notes, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that was kind of like the first one of the, the bunch really. Yeah. I think that was the first, I, I don't know if it was that video, but I think the first piece of content I saw from you was, um, you know, one of those, how to make this type of melody and, you know, you're an FL Studio user. So this, the shit that you guys do makes my head spin. It's like you'll 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 make a, a melody, and I'm like, ah, eh, that's cool. And then you do some other shit, and you like you reverse it, and then pitch bend it, and then add something else, and then gross beat it, and then flip it, and then <laughs> like by the time you're done, I'm like, what, what, whoa, this. Uh, so when I saw that, I was like, damn, this this is dope. Uh, and I, and I like watching that stuff because I don't use FL. So it kind of challenges me to do um, something different in, in my process. But I do want to switch DAWs because because that, you know, all like it's a pain in the ass to try to do FL Studio stuff when you're not an FL Studio user. Yeah, just can't. Well, some of the updates, too, that are coming with with FL are just I'm not saying they're going to change the whole landscape of DAWs, but I think they're they're pretty pretty interesting updates to to see happening yeah which one are you most excited about okay this is kind of nerdy of me but with like the whole computer science background I, i'm most excited about like the the piano roll scripting that they added in uh, just because i know i want to mess around with some scripts kind of make something see what i can do how do you i don't that's above my pay grade how do you even program a script for fl studio piano roll I still need to read into it because they released their own um, their own API for it. Uh, I have to kind of go through their documentation, but um, pretty much you just write a text file, essentially um, call import their API, and then you can just use that to generate MIDI, or you can use it to modify your MIDI or do whatever you kind of want. So there's a, there's like a humanized one, and just humanizes your MIDI very well. See, that's that github.com talk where I like I'll go on there and I'm like, I don't know what what is this? What do I do? I'm very much out of the loop. But then again, I did not go to college. Sorry, I, I did not go to university for anything related to computer programming. Okay, so your nine to five is is computer stuff that I don't understand. Um what 
what would it take for you to quit that job and go full time with music production? I think I would need to kind of be in a, a very stable place with it. Um, just because like I'm, I'm living on my own. I don't really have any kind of safety net or, or support other than just like moving back with my parents. And that's that's not really ideal um, for, for a 25 year old. So just kind of hoping for that that stability and, and kind of building that up as as I go. See, I did it the opposite as you actually. <laughs> I was I went finished grad school and everything living with my parents. And then I was like, all right, cool. Now it's time to make money and get out of here. So um I don't know. I think I think anyone can can make a situation. Maybe it depends on your relationship with your parents. If you love your parents but you don't want to live with them. It might be good incentive because every day you wake up, you're like, "Damn, I got to get out of here. Let me let me make a, a hit record and get the fuck up, up up out of here to my own place." Or if like living with your parents is a dream come true, then might that might be you know demotivating because you'll never want to leave. Uh, so a lot of producer channels are seeing their views and engagement drop. Mm-hmm. And and it's a pretty noticeable drop. I don't know if you've noticed that. I don't know if you don't need to say names. You can say my name if you want. That's definite. Like I was I was on a rise and I was getting, you know, a few thousand new subs every month and then back to a thousand. But what would you say is is the key to growing your channel well? Other channels are either suffering or kind of flatlining in terms of their growth. I think well, this, this is a little bit more my opinion on the whole producer content realm. Um, it, it feels a lot like when I watch producer content, sometimes even my own, it feels like it's a little bit behind where general content is. Like, you know, if you watch like, I don't know, like a, a vlogger or just like a regular YouTuber, they have a lot going on. Like it's constant action. Whereas if you watch a, a producer do a tutorial, it's very slow paced. It, and that's, potentially why the engagement's falling off a little bit Um, because at this point in time, there's more producers than there ever have been. And there's always going to get to be more and more, and there's never going to be enough educational content or just content in general for those types of people. So it's not necessarily an issue from that standpoint. It's just the content needs to kind of get to a a higher standard. And that's kind of something I've been trying to do a little bit more of, uh, with my videos, just make them more engaging, um, kind of sprinkle in some humor here and there and just ways that I can connect with my audience. So are you editing all your own stuff then? No, I'm, I'm very fortunate because I'm terrible okay. at editing. I was uh, going to say I, that. I, yeah. yeah. So do you, so you outsource your editing? Do you outsource your thumbnail design too? Yeah, I can't, I can't do visual art like that at all for sure. So it, I, I, you don't have to answer this. Is this somebody that reached out to you? Is this someone that you reached out to? Is it like a collaborative thing or is it just you're paying for a service? So for thumbnails, someone reached out to me. Um, he sent me like a free demo. I checked it out. I, I liked it. It was a lot better than what I had going on at the time. So I was like, okay, let's, let's kind of work. Um, and, and I've built like a pretty good working relationship with, with that person since then, just kind of kept that pushing. Uh, and for videos, it's actually my friend Faded Wave. He's been editing my videos for I don't even know how long now, but he he does a phenomenal job. I know the second he took over editing for my channel, my views doubled within a week or two. Okay, so that's also part of it. Yeah, I guess people's attention spans are kind of mm-hmm. well, they're falling off with with so right. much short form content out there. Yeah, so then a producer comes along, they want to push the limits by making a video that's longer than 10 minutes. And then, yeah, cause I thought of that. I'm like, I'll make a really good piece of content and it's, you know, 12 minutes. It's like, you know, the secret to making a million dollars off beats tomorrow and, you know, gets 5,000 views. But if I had a video called like making a beat with my dick and it's like all these, you know, fire emojis flying and like every other second, the Jordan crying face comes in and there's a mm-hmm. meme over here and, you know, another fucking meme comes in here and it's rotoscoped and, you know, like 80,000 views in the first hour. Yeah, I think there's something to be said about that. A lot of producer content is leaning more towards entertainment than education. So if 
you can balance both somehow, then you're going to see quite a bit of growth. And I think that's what you're doing. It's not, you're not just out there to entertain. I think the core of what you're creating is still yeah. it's, it's educational. It's, it's, I don't know, I guess without the humor, without the editing, without the thumbnails, it would be more uh, pedantic, I guess. I, would people, I, I don't, I guess I don't know. Cause I see the edited stuff and it looks cool, but Otherwise, it would be, I guess, it would be more like mine because I'm editing my own. And I'm like, this could be a good moment for me to, you know, fly in. I don't know, like Will Smith smacking the shit out of Chris Rock. I'm like, that's, that's going to take me an hour. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's already 12 in the damn morning. I'm, I, nah. I don't know. So were you, were you trying to do that? Was that something that you realized before you got an editor or after the fact you're like, Oh, this is what I've been missing. I, I knew like I needed something um, from an engagement standpoint. Um, and my, my editor, my friend faded, he very much kind of pointed that out to me. He was like, Hey, like we could speed up your videos so much. We could make them a lot more engaging. Uh, and, that's kind of what we've been doing. But at the same time too, I do think there's, there's a place out there, like you mentioned for those longer videos, it's just the demographics are a little different. It's, it's, it's like you will, you will see a much younger demographic watching a short, very quick, very fast reward kind of video. Whereas you'll see a, an older audience watching like a longer YouTube video. Um, I know for me personally, like I watch like 36, 48 minute YouTube videos regularly. And I think that's just like my age kind of speaking. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not even that old. Shout out to all the old ass people watching this video right now. Cause, cause we're already at, we're pushing the limits. We're at like 25 minutes now. So we should probably end it pretty soon. Um, who, whose content do you like watching? So I don't know if, if you've ever seen his, his short form content, but it kind of inspired my very early short form content, but it, he's, his name's uh, Curtains. Um, and honestly, like I just kind of enjoyed watching how he break, broke down his melodies very quickly. Um, just very much an impersonal way though, just having like text on screen. Um, <clears throat> for a long time, I really liked Lucent's content, Finna Finesse, uh, Cody, a lot of like the internet money people are liked watching their streams um, and just kind of pausing it, watching it for myself in, in slow motion, I guess, because I'd pause it so often and break down what they were doing. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it also is DAW specific. The FL studio content is really entertaining to watch. I, probably because FL studio just has a really cool workflow and, mm -hmm it's visually appealing as well. So oh, yeah, especially with the, the themes that you can kind of make yeah. nowadays. Well, yeah. And it's move, you know, when, once you become fluent in a program like FL, you're just flying and it probably helps because people are rewinding like, Oh, that's how you do it. You know, the, the, the newer users, so yeah. you're getting more watch time out of these people. The you FL studio users are sneaky. Uh, moving forward. What, what are your, goals for your channel honestly i hit my goals for this year already and, and that's kind of something i've been been doing every year i sit down i set up my goals for the year going forward um and i've hit them each year a little earlier than expected um so right now off the top of my head i don't actually have any direct goals i i have a little bit more goals kind of on the side with with um like the business I have with, with some of my friends called presetsupply.com. I know I mentioned it to you, um, but I'm, I'm looking to grow that with them a little bit and just kind of fleshing out the, my quote unquote sound design career, just cause it's, it's kind of fun to make sounds, honestly. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's really fun. Especially if you, if you can make them sound cool. Oh yeah. So, so someone like me might say, all right, producer, YouTube is dead or it's dying at least. But what you're saying is I'm just boring. Probably. No, I would, I would say, I would say you need to target your demographic more specifically, you know, and maybe you need to sit down and think about what your demographic is um, and why they're your demographic. Mm. Yeah, that is a good question. And I do. Well, YouTube does have, 
analytics. And so that should inform the content, right? Have you checked your analytics and has it shifted from uh, a certain age group to a younger sort of viewership now that you've changed up your, your strategy? So my, my age group on, or at least my predominant uh, age group on, on YouTube is the 18 to 24 age range. Um, but at the same time, I don't know how much to, to trust that number because people can just lie about their age on the internet super easily. Oh yeah. I'm um, 17 so, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I kind of go off what it, what it tells me for that. And I know something that kind of helped me was, was talking or at least doing it in a way where it's talking to myself when I was in that kind of age. And that's around the time that I started producing around like 22 or so. Yeah, I mean, this is just more of a, this is a selfish, I'm like getting a free consultation under the guise of a, of a podcast episode here, trying to figure this all out. No, it, it is really cool to see people who are succeeding and at the rate that you're growing, just when you kind of are an exception. I, I don't know too many other producer channels that are growing. I think on the surface, we see a lot of producers that, appear to be doing well because their content might be shocking or controversial and, and so it creates the, uh, I don't know, the illusion of growth, but the numbers are undeniable for you. So congratulations. That's, that's amazing. You. Um, how, how do people follow you? How do they find your content? How do they buy your, I know you, you shouted it out once, but shout it out again. How do they buy your um, original sounds? So, for well, how most people find me, or at least in my opinion, how most people find me is through short form content. Um, and something I've been working on with my channel a little bit is, is directing or getting more viewers on like full length videos um, and making that kind of like the, a way that people can find me. And, and fortunately that's now, I think the third most searched for or not searched for, I don't even know what the word is, you know, like, that's the third most way people find my YouTube channel. Um, and, and that just kind of comes down to making good titles. Tags don't really matter, but they kind of matter a little bit. Um, and, and from there, it's, it's kind of just like entered into my community. Um, I know you, you said shout it out. I will shout it out. Uh, it's, it's my website, presetsupply.com. Uh, pretty much all my kits are on there. And I think the, the only way or that people kind of find out about it is from my content. Cause there is no ad spend. There's not really much outside promotion going on for that. Cause it's, it's been around since the beginning of April by now. So it's still, still pretty new, but a lot of good sounds on there, honestly. Okay. Last question. So you said, um, I think you said keywords don't matter so much. What would you say, is the most important part of content on YouTube mm -hmm. in 2023? Is it title? Is it thumbnail? And what strategies are you using to ensure that you have the most compelling and optimized SEO on your, on your videos? Yeah. So it's definitely, definitely like without a, a shadow of a doubt, title and, and thumbnail. Um, for, for shorts, it's a little bit different just because you don't necessarily see the title oftentimes and you don't get to upload a thumbnail. Um, but the title kind of mat matters for how the YouTube algorithm is going to push your content, who it's going to push it to. Um, for full length videos, the title and the thumbnail though are definitely the biggest things, having them being like short, concise, and also an engaging title. And that was kind of one thing that took me a little while to learn with my YouTube journey of just having a, a good and engaging title. So I know like an example is like, if you're doing a video, you, you want to have the title be more of a draw. You want to have some kind of personal connection in there, or you want to have something that makes the, the viewer go and, and just kind of question what is not what the video is about, but what's going on in the video a little bit. Okay. Yeah. How should I title this one? Um, Riley beats threatens DJ Payne one. I think that is going to work. I think that'll work. I think that's, I think that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then I can make the thumbnail and like you're holding a knife. Yeah. I'll pose for it. And I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll take a, I, I at least know how to export a, a screenshot. And well, there you my, go. You're, you're good. 
Cool, man. Yellow. <laughs> I mean, you, you've seen my thumbnails. That's kind of right up my alley. Put it, you know, photoshopping a knife in your hand. Well, I really liked the busy works beats one you did. I thought that was <laughs> really, really engaging. Like I saw it and I was like, this makes me want to click on it right away. You know, shout out to busy. I always felt like busy works had a good sense of humor and he can, you know, he, he just doesn't take things too seriously. But subconsciously I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to get a text message the next day. And no, it was just like, oh, these, these thumbnails are hilarious. I'm like, oh, you think that's funny? I'm going to put your head on the Mean Girls uh, movie poster next. Watch that. And he didn't care. So now I feel like uh, I, I still need to ask people who I don't you know, really have like longstanding relationships with before yeah. doing that. But you're cool with the knife in your hand and being implicated as some sort of um, homicidal Canadian maniac. So I appreciate that. That's what we do. It it uh it is. I I, I watch true crime podcast. Yeah. But hey, I'm in Wisconsin, so we're like the serial killer capital of the world, which is, is not really something to be proud of. So I'm just gonna end the podcast right now because it's getting uncomfortable. <laughs> Once again, man, I really appreciate you doing this. Um, thank you. Much continued success. Uh yeah, your channel's blowing up and I think deservedly so. So thank you. It's gonna be amazing to see what, what you're doing you know, moving forward into 2024. Thank you. I appreciate that big time.